Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings, and welcome to our C-SPAN audience and to our webcast audience. Please note that the hashtag for this event is CEPM. My name is Elaine K. Mark. I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings, and I'm pleased to be announcing the opening of Brookings' newest center, the Center for Effective Public Management. So allow me for a moment to talk about our vision for this center. I don't need to tell you that things aren't going so well in Washington these days. <laughs> Indeed, we opened this center on the eve of a government shutdown. How fitting. In fact, if you are out and about on the streets of Washington today, you may notice that people seem a little unusually depressed or anxious. In fact, if I owned a bar, I'd call in extra help for tonight. And that's because yesterday, agencies issued their shutdown instructions to the staff, and some one million people were told that they were non-essential employees. As you can imagine, that's quite a blow to one's ego. All in all, a pretty tough message to get. So let me tell you briefly what I hope we can accomplish at this center. When Washington works, it works because politicians and their appointees bring new energy and new ideas to town. When it works, it works because they confront the experienced members of the permanent government, the civil servants, who know a thing or two about how to make the place work. The result is a dynamic tension between change and stability. This has been the hallmark of our government, and in fact, it is the hallmark of all successful modern democracies. But these are troubled times for America's leaders, political as well as civil servants. When Washington doesn't work, the politicians can't manage to put their country above their interests and their ideologies. As everything gets politicized, the civil servants move into a defensive crouch afraid to stick their heads up, lest they get shot off. As we've seen, progress stops on all fronts, from big picture items like the need for immigration reform or the need to cope with climate change, to the need for technical amendments to the Affordable Care Act, something that, in more normal times, would have been passed without notice, but that in these polarized times can't even be introduced to the Congress. At this center, we will deal with both politics and government, making it a little different from undertakings in the past with similar names. We will focus on political reforms that can help create more effective leadership by getting to the roots of our political dysfunction. We will look at the future of federalism in the United States and ask maybe if the states shouldn't come back to their rightful place as laboratories of democracy. We will try to understand what happens to regulation in a government in an era where the change is so rapid and technological and scientific change is so rapid. We will try to foster a spirit of innovation in government through our new blog, FixGov, and we will look at the current system of capitalism and ask if perhaps it could be structured in a more sustainable way through our corporate purpose project. All of this is geared towards making both parts of the government, the political and the career, more able to engage in what my friend and former colleague Leon Firth has called anticipatory governance. In today's government, about the only thing we can anticipate is gridlock. Certainly, the most prosperous and powerful nation in the world can do better. I'd like now to introduce an old friend, David Rubenstein. David is co-founder and co-chief executive of the Carlyle Group. Prior to forming the firm in 1987, David practiced law in Washington, D.C. I got to know him when, from 1997 to 1981, during the Carter administration, David was deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. Before that, he served as chief counsel to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments, and before that, he practiced law in New York City. David is a magna cum laude graduate of Duke University. Following Duke, he attended the University of Chicago Law School. 
Among his many philanthropic endeavors, David is the chairman of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, a regent of the Smithsonian Institution, president of the Economic Club of Washington, and on the board of trustees of Duke University and vice chair here at the Brookings Institution, and also vice chair of the Council on Foreign Relations. In fact, every time I turn around, I find another example of David's generosity. One of our buildings at the Kennedy School at Harvard, where I came from, is the David M. Rubenstein Building. And last week, we had a birthday party for my grandson, Vincent, at the zoo. And there, it turns out that the Panda Pavilion exists courtesy of, you got it, David Rubenstein. <laughs> David, if I was one of your children, I'd be seriously concerned about this tendency of yours to give money away. <laughs> Back in the Carter administration, David was famous for long hours in the White House and for eating dinner from the wet vending machines in the basement of the White House. I had the dubious distinction of writing the 1980 Democratic Party platform, and so some years ago, I spent long hours at the White House with David and Alice, who was later to become his wife. David, had I known then how much money you'd have to give away, I would have cooked you homemade lasagna and brought it to the White House. <laughs> Anyways, before David comes up here to introduce former Vice President Gore, I'd like to remind the audience the hashtag for the event is there for both our virtual audience and our audience in the room. And also, there are note cards on each seat for your questions for Vice President Gore. As he's speaking, our staff members will be coming around to collect them so we can take some Q&A at the end of the Vice President's presentation. Thank you very much for being with us. David? Thank you very much, Elaine. It was uh, nearly a uh, hundred years ago that Robert Brookings decided that government could be managed somewhat more effectively than it was being managed. And he put up some money, modest in those days, uh, or by today's standards, certainly modest, uh, to put together some institutes that would study uh, how government could be made more effective. Ultimately, these came together in 1916 as the Brookings Institution. It's altogether fitting that as we get close to celebrating the 100th anniversary of Brookings, we are, in effect, returning to our roots a bit by creating this center, because this center will help us study even more intensely than we do today how we can make our government work much better. And it's, of course, altogether fitting that the person who's going to kick off this center with this speech today is Al Gore, who, among other things, when he was vice president of the United States, our 45th vice president, he led the Reinventing of Government project. And that effort really did many things to make our government more effective and more efficient. And I, I wish today that the government was effective as effi and efficient as uh, we would like it to be. But many of the things that Al Gore put into place and recommended to President Clinton did come to be and are now some of the things that we are fortunate to have with us. Um, it was years ago that another group of people began to think about reinventing government. It was last week, 226 years ago, that a number of individuals, 55 of them, came together in Philadelphia and said, let's reinvent the government we have. And they took the Articles of Confederation government and tore it up and came up with this incredible document called the U.S. Constitution. Now, it wasn't a perfect document, and it didn't create a perfect government, but it did do more than any other government in history to come, to come together in a democratic form and a government which has lasted for some 200 years. So think about that. Over 200 years ago, people came together, they spent about three months working on how a government should be structured, and they came up with a system that wasn't perfect, and as we are reminded by Elaine and we know today, we see the imperfections of our system every day now on Capitol Hill. However, with the exception of some amendments we've had to make that system better, we have, in effect, put together a government that is as effective as any in, the system, in, our country, in the world's history. And it's a government that I think has its imperfections, but it can be improved upon, and it should be improved upon. Uh, had he been around about 260 years ago or so, and um, been of age, I think our guest today would have been a founding father, because he no doubt would have been invited to that Constitutional Convention. He had the intelligence, 
he had the drive, he had the commitment to make the world a better place, and he had the ability to really work effectively with other people. It is to our great uh, regret that he was not a founding father, and one of the reasons for that is that no doubt he would have been prescient enough had he been involved in those days to recommend that as part of the government, we might have direct election of the president. <laughs> But he wasn't around then, and uh, so we have a different system, and perhaps uh, we can study whether direct election of the president would make the government more effective. You never know. Um, I do think, though, that we, our, our, our country owes Al Gore two great favors, because while he was born much later than he might have been born to be a founding father, there are two things that I really want to cite right now as why I think our country is in his, his debt. First, when that famous election happened in the year 2000, it was obviously a very complicated, difficult situation for our country. And it's not clear that other individuals or other governments would have acted the same way. I know had I been in a situation that Al Gore faced himself, I wouldn't have handled myself nearly as well as he did. He recognized, though, that the most important thing in this country is the rule of law. And while the system may not have been perfect, and maybe the government that was invented by the Founding Fathers didn't work as well as we would all like, it was important that everybody recognize the rule of law prevails. And so Al Gore did what I think every great uh, citizen should do, recognize that the rule of law is more important than anybody's individual ambitions and anybody's individual plans. And so he basically said, I think the system should work. It isn't working as well as I think it should, but we should let the system work. And he, in effect, left town, let his successor do what he wanted to do, and he basically did not disrupt that government. And I think that's a very important thing. While we all may have had disagreements with what happened in that administration, there's no doubt that uh, allowing the rule of law to prevail is an important thing, and I think it's a set a lesson for people all over the world. And for that, and letting the rule of law prevail, I think that's a very important thing that Al Gore did for our country. And then when he left Washington to return to his native Tennessee, what did he do? He reinvented himself. What he decided to do was to pursue what I consider the highest calling of mankind private equity. <laughs> much, much more successfully, much more success, successfully than many people have left government, he basically returned to the private sector and showed that after government service, you can do very useful things uh, in the private sector. And he's done an incredible job of building a number of companies which have been quite successful. But he did one other thing that I think is, is, puts us all in his debt, and it's this. And it may be something more significant than anything any of us have ever done or anybody in this city has ever done or ever will do. He basically made it clear to people that we have a problem with the way our globe is working. There is a problem with climate. And against great odds and against derision at times, he said, no, we have to recognize that the world is warming up and there has to be something done about it. And while we might not be able in our lifetime to really have dramatic effects on climate change, we have to begin now. And although he was criticized by, for, by many people and is still criticized by many people for what he has done, the truth is the world has recognized in the form of a Nobel Prize that what he did was a great thing for humanity. And so when history is written, people will say, who changed the world the most in the lifetime of which we all live? And there will be many people who will be uh, given that potential uh, honor. But I think nobody is likely to receive that honor more than Al Gore because Al Gore really stead, uh, stepped up and said, the world has to do something about this global problem. It's not just a national problem, it's a global problem. And every government has to reinvent itself to make sure that it's doing something to conquer and challenge the, the problems of global uh, change, global, warm, uh, global climate change. And therefore, I hope very much people recognize that when they hear Al Gore today, they're seeing a man who not only did something great for our country, which is to recognize the rule of law, but he's done something great for the world, which is to say we have to attack this most important problem, global climate change. And therefore, we are all uh, very honored that he's come today to kick off this center, and we are all very honored that he's uh, done the things that he's done in his life, and he has reinvented himself and helped to reinvent our government, and now I hope he can help to reinvent Brookings. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the warm welcome. And David, thank you for that over-the-top uh, introduction. I cannot uh, remember who deserves credit for first using uh, this old line. I'm sure you've all uh, heard it, uh, but uh, my, my father would have enjoyed that and my mother would have believed it. And I, <laughs> I really uh, appreciate it. And your, your comments about the um, election, uh, you know, my, my attitude is you win some, you lose some, and then there's that little known third category. And, uh, <laughs> And as for how to react uh, uh, to it, uh, I did actually uh, study the work of the Founding Fathers uh, in some detail during those days, and, and uh, I confirmed my uh, worry that, that actually in our system uh, there is no intermediate uh, step between a final Supreme Court decision and violent revolution. And... Um, <clears throat> Given those options, uh, I, I basically did only uh, what uh, the American people are credited uh, for doing, by, famously by Winston Churchill. They generally do the right thing after first exhausting every available alternative. And of course, we are here today at a moment when we are exhausting uh, a lot of uh, alternatives to keeping the government running. But David, thank you for your kindness and for... Uh, your generosity and, and leadership in so many spheres um, of our life together. Uh, I'm going to, I, I want to also acknowledge Daryl West, uh, Vice President of Governance Studies uh, here at Brookings, and um, I'm going to get to uh, Elaine uh, in just a moment and talk about uh, this important new center, but uh, I also want to acknowledge one of the, uh, one of your, uh, one of the board members here uh, at Brookings, my friend and uh, uh, longtime business partner, Joel Hyatt, who, as uh, some of you have heard me say on many occasions, is absolutely the best uh, partner anybody could ever have. And our uh, partnership uh, recently ended uh, very successfully, but uh, the friendship uh, uh, will be um, eternal. If I had to pick one person to be in a foxhole with, uh, it would be Joel. A lot of my former um, Colleagues in government uh, are, are here. Leon Firth was mentioned uh, by Elaine. Bill Galston, senior fellow uh, here, uh, is present. Uh, uh, and some of my uh, former colleagues in the Congress, uh, bar, former, uh, let's see, uh, Congresswoman Jill Long Thompson, who I greeted uh, just uh, on the way in, and some of my uh, friends uh, in uh, um, the the uh, campaign uh, years, uh, Donna Brazil, my former campaign manager, is here somewhere, and Tad uh, Devine, uh, who uh, was a, uh, an important uh, leader in the campaign, um, and my other colleagues uh, from the White House years, in addition to Elaine and Leon, include Gordon Adams and Jim Kohlenberger, Leanne Brackett, uh, Kiki McLean, Sally Katzen, Rob Shapiro, Mike Orfini, uh, Paul Weinstein, uh, Ellen Oaks, uh, and others. I also want to acknowledge uh, Josh Gottbaum, the U.S. Pension Benefit Guarantee uh, Corporation head. Uh, and so now to uh, Elaine. I have uh, <laughs> known uh, Elaine Shula Kmark for uh, 20 years, almost exactly um, uh, 20 years. Uh, and I want to acknowledge her uh, husband, Tino, uh, who also was, uh, 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 in a previous uh, lifetime, a tremendous public servant running the XM uh, Bank. Um, and uh, their, uh, their daughter-in-law, uh, Christy, uh, who is here, and Elaine's uh, uh, sister, Joanne Shula. Um, but Elaine is, uh, by all odds, one of the most uh, talented uh, people that I've ever worked with, uh, and whether it's in uh, the sphere of governance or in politics, uh, she is uh, just truly outstanding, and everybody who's worked with her knows that. And to the powers that be here in Brookings, congratulations. 
in uh, wooing her away from uh, being a professor at Harvard and uh, establishing this uh, important center. I'm going to talk uh, in a moment about why I think this is unusually significant and important. It, it truly is. It's hard, it's hard work. Uh, but there is literally no one in the world who understands it better or more thoroughly than Elaine K. Mark. That's, that's literally the tr truth. There, there are slightly more than seven billion people in the world, <laughs> and only one Elaine <laughs> K. Mark. Uh, so, you know, that's pretty special. Um, but it's all true. Um, in any case, uh, I'm really happy to be here. There, I, I'm glad you all picked a slow news day to, uh, <laughs> to launch this uh, new center. Uh, <laughs> the most important news uh, of the day, other than this launch, uh, is actually not the, the pending uh, potential shutdown of the government or pending potential default. I do want to talk about that briefly, but um, it is the release uh, this morning in Stockholm of the fifth uh, assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and um, you've, uh, you may have seen it in the news, and if you haven't, I, I urge you to look at it. Uh, I, I, it's not the topic that brings us here today, but it is intimately connected because we have a set of challenges that we must now uh, confront that are very different in kind and, uh, and, and, and uh, difficulty that, uh, compared to any um, issues uh, that we have ever had to face. And our ability to do it competently uh, is absolutely uh, crucial uh, to, to the success uh, of what we're undertaking. But, you know, where the uh, report from Stockholm uh, is concerned, um, th they used to be uh, certain only to a degree somewhere between 90% and 100%. Now uh, they're certain uh, to a degree somewhere between 95% and 100%. I'm sure that'll make all the difference uh, uh, to, to those who are wondering how serious this is. But um, joking aside, uh, we're still putting 90 million tons of global warming pollution into the atmosphere every 24 hours. Uh, as if the atmosphere is an open sewer. Uh, and the cumulative amount of man-made global warming pollution now trapped there is uh, trapping as much heat every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every single day. Uh, and, and it's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy. And it's that energy that's disrupting the water cycle that's central to life on Earth, uh, disrupting the stable pattern of climate and weather systems that's been in place since the first cities uh, were built 9,000 years ago, uh, melting the ice and raising sea level, uh, drying out uh, the land surfaces uh, in important regions, including our own Southwest and soon in our own Midwest, uh, Southern Europe, uh, Southern Africa, Central America, the Amazon, the list goes on, causing uh, all the extra water vapor to evaporate from the oceans into warmer skies that hold much more, creating much larger downpours that trigger the kind of flooding that we saw in Boulder, Colorado over the last few weeks in Nashville, my hometown, uh, three years ago, in Pakistan, uh, in that year when 20 million people were displaced from their homes, uh, further destabilizing a nuclear-armed, fragile country. Uh, and, and that list goes on, creating more fires. We've seen them in the West this year of our own country. We saw them in Russia the, uh, a few years ago, leading to the uh, removal of all grain f from world markets by Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, leading to the highest uh, food price spike in world history. 
Uh, and at that moment, a food vendor in Tunisia set himself on fire. And although there were many other factors that contributed to that individual tragedy and the events that uh, soon thereafter unfolded, food riots uh, have followed crop failures uh, in recent events uh, related to climate disruption. Uh, climate refugees are challenging the ability of governments to remain stable. And in uh, those developing regions where governance is already on a knife edge, uh, there are now uh, uh, the gr there is now the growing threat of uh, more post-national entities and the problems that come from it. So we have to address this. Uh, we have to put a price on carbon in the economy, and we have to put a price on denial in the political system. Uh, and uh, I will have more to say about this on many other occasions, but because this report was released just hours before we gathered here, I would not have felt right about uh, not addressing it. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, potential for a shutdown in just a moment, but uh, I, I think the only phrase that describes it is political terrorism. Nice uh, global economy you got there. Be a shame if we had to destroy it. We have a list of demands. If you don't meet them all by our deadline, we'll blow up the global economy. Really? Um, where are the American people in this? Why does partisanship have anything to do with such a despicable and dishonorable threat to the integrity of the United States of America? It cannot be allowed but it can only be stopped if people in both parties and independents as well say, look, I might not agree with everything that is in the Affordable Care Act, but it did pass. It was upheld by the Supreme Court. It is the law of the land. You didn't succeed in the constitutional process by which this was considered. And now you want to threaten to not only shut down our government, but to blow up the world economy unless we go back and undo what we did according to the processes of our democracy? How dare you? How dare you? But it doesn't matter what I feel or what many of you feel unless the American people not only feel it, but express it. I sure did appreciate my fellow Tennessean, Senator Bob Corker, yesterday. Uh, and I disagree with him on all kind of things, most things, I guess. <laughs> but I, I really appreciated the, the, uh, the spirit and sentiments that he manifested there. In any case, one of the reasons why there has been uh, too much tolerance of trifling with the shutdown of the government and the uh, forcing of a default on payments that are owed, uh, is that uh, the hostility to the very idea of government, which is in part <laughs> something that goes way back to the days of King George, but has uh, been fed by uh, too many instances of uh, poor management, uh, problems that are allowed to linger, uh, incompetence, uh, bureaucracies that uh, seize up and don't function well. So the work of this center in bringing to bear the best minds available, uh, the, the best scholarship available, under the leadership of the best uh, leader of this center you could possibly have, this work is really important far beyond what many might think of when they see the nameplate on the door or read the short description of what it does. This is really um, about the 
the hard work and fresh thinking that is now essential in order to redeem the promise of self-governance. We are still in Lincoln's phrase, the last best hope. And the U.S. Constitution is still uh, having been uh, changed and made better over the, the last two and a quarter centuries. The finest document on governance ever devised. But as uh, we implement that document and administer the programs of government, we have to do it well. And we all know uh, when we go into a, a business or a store that clearly gets it and has incorporated uh, the finest lessons of high quality management and serves its customers extremely well and the costs are uh, surprisingly uh, low compared to what we might have thought when we walked in and everything clicks and we recognize such businesses and we patronize them. And there are reasons why they operate so well. And the same principles that have led to their success can be applied to the public sector. So it was 20 years ago this month that I went out on the South Lawn of the White House and presented President Clinton with the first report of the National Performance Review, also known as Reinventing Government, and in popular parlance we called it Rego, which was Gore spelled sideways, um, <laughs> for Reinventing Government. We held this event in front of two enormous forklifts piled high with government documents intended uh, to serve as symbols of the excessive bureaucracy and the frustration that most Americans associated with the government. We worked at reinventing government in Rigo for the entire two terms. Uh, that we were privileged to be in office. And I'm very proud to say that a great many of the ideas and practices that were new back then are standard operating procedure in the federal government today. And looking back, the reinventing government movement started actually three revolutions in government. And I'm going to list them one by one. All three of these revolutions have not only survived in one form or another within the U.S. federal system, many of them have moved, well, all three of these revolution, uh, revolutions have moved to state and local governments, and they have been emulated in countries around the world. In the wake of our Reinventing Government initiative, the United Nations sponsored a series of global conferences to take these ideas and spread them to other countries. And these meetings continue uh, to this day. Public policy students now routinely study things that began 20 years ago with the team of change agents in the reinventing government movement. Now, I often um, refer to myself uh, as a recovering politician, David. Uh, <laughs> Um, on about step nine, and uh, um, the, the, the longer uh, I, I go without a, a, a relapse, uh, the more confidence I have that I'll not get back into it. But, um, but after 20 years, I, I like to think that I have earned the right to do a little bragging, not as a politician, but as someone who was very lucky to be able to work with hundreds of determined reformers, men and women, many of whom still work for the federal government, who accomplished great things, who answered the call uh, and performed in an outstanding way. And I am indeed extremely proud of what they have done and continue to do. Now, these three revolutions, the first revolution, the performance revolution, 
required a cultural transformation for many agencies because it entailed a new way of thinking and a new way of doing business. Unlike prior uh, attempts at measuring government performance that were initiated and then soon thereafter abandoned, this one has now lasted for two decades. President George W. Bush expanded on the idea by creating an innovation known as PART, the Program Assessment Rating Tool. And President Obama appointed the federal government's first chief performance officer and signed into law amendments to uh, GPRA, the Government Performance uh, and Accounting Act, that embedded some of the best innovations that evolved since that original law was enacted in the wake of our Reinventing Government Report in 1993. This new idea to set goals and measure government performance against those goals can now be found in the federal government and in city and state governments. And I am very proud that we were there at the beginning of the performance revolution. The second revolution we launched was the customer revolution. Now, the word customer uh, created some controversy when we used uh, the phrase customer revolution. In some quarters, people objected that the citizens we were referring to were, in fact, owners of uh, the government. Nevertheless, there was no other word other than customers that so accurately conveyed to our workforce how we wanted our citizens to be treated. So we stuck with that word. And to this day, federal agencies that deal with the public measure their performance in the quality that they bring to serving their customers. One quick example that stuck with me from those years, we went out and studied the uh, rather isolated examples of governmental units that had actually pioneered some of the things that we instituted in the federal government. And, and we went and spent time with uh, private corporations that were known for efficiency. I'll never forget spending two days uh, uh, shadowing uh, Herb Kelleher at uh, Southwest <laughs> Airlines. What a kick that was. <laughs> But I learned a lot from uh, Herb and, and from uh, several of the others, uh, uh, the other CEOs that I met with. But I remember an example from one of the de one of the State Department of Motor Vehicles. Of course, the DMV is kind of a symbol of for, for many people of everything that can go wrong. Anyway, this particular DMV uh, decided that they had to reform, and they just assumed that what they needed to do was pull out all the stops to reduce the waiting period and the length of the lines. And so they went through their uh, work and before they pulled the trigger and implemented the reforms, they decided, well, maybe we ought to ask the people uh, who we're trying to uh, help here what they think about it. Well, it's a clever idea and they, they, uh, <laughs> they did that. Uh, and, and they were shocked. Uh, the, the biggest complaint that, they f that these folks waiting in line wanted fixed was not the line. You know what it was? It was the picture. <laughs> they, stood, they stood in line once every two or three years, and they looked at that picture uh, <laughs> quite a few times a week. And so they re-engineered the system to give them choices and so forth, and it didn't add that much extra time, but people responded to it. And they also shortened the lines. But <laughs> there are many uh, similar examples of wisdom that is impossible to gain access to unless you engage in a dialogue with the people to whom you are trying to deliver the services of government. The third revolution was the innovation revolution. 20 years ago when I entered the White House, there were 50 sites on the World Wide Web, 5-0. Um, 
there were one or two other geek wannabes like me who uh, used it, but um, there was no such thing as a government website. The word website was, uh, uh, you know, you might as well have been talking about something on the surface of Mars, uh, let alone um, th was there any ability to conduct government transactions online. But a few years after we launched this initiative, we published a, a book entitled Access America, Reengineering Through Information Technology. And in an age when less than 25% of the public was online, we actually released this four years later, this was in 97, and even then less than 25% uh, were online, this report summarized what was to come. The internet would be used to bring information to the public on its terms. Information technology made it possible to begin implementation of a nationwide electronic benefits transfer program to, to integrate information in the criminal justice community and to provide simplified employer tax filing and reporting. It also began the integration of government information through the creation of firstgov.gov, the federal government's first comprehensive web portal launched in 2000. Today it's called USA.gov, but its purpose is the same, to offer citizens one-stop access to government information. And this innovation also was quickly spread to state governments and local governments and governments in countries and regions and municipalities throughout the world. So I'm proud of what our team did uh, on that as well. I like to think that we left the government in better shape than we found it. And I believe that is still true today, especially for the career people who keep this thing going. In spite of sequesters, shutdowns, and of course nonstop criticism, the federal workers land our planes safely in ever crowded airports. They track down the bacteria that sickens people uh, in unsafe food, in cha food chains or grocery stores. They get the retirement checks out on time. They protect Americans here and abroad. So the federal workers are not the problem. The political class is the problem. And just as we began our reinventing government work by saying that the, the federal workers were good people trapped in a bad system and that what needed to change was the system, our political class is trapped in a bad system. Many of them are very good people, very dedicated, some of them here. But the system uh, has grown, ha has been degraded. And Mr. Mann, you and uh, Mr. Ornstein were prescient when you wrote, it's worse than you think. <laughs> uh, it is. and maybe even worse than you th thought, uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you for that wonderful book. I know you, you and Norm took a lot of heat for it. But ladies and gentlemen, American democracy has been hacked. That's a computer word, as you know, <laughs> which means, which refers to, to uh, somebody taking over the operating system of a computer and making it do things that the owner of the computer doesn't want it to do. Well, our democracy has been hacked. Its operating system has been taken over by special interests, by using big money and lobbyists and taking advantage of a very sick political culture that has grown worse very rapidly in, in the last uh, couple of decades. It needs to be fixed. Like many other uh, citizens, I've been dismayed by what's been going on uh, in Washington, D.C. and in the political decision-making process. 
the level of partisanship and vitriol has been growing, of course, and that too is connected to the influence of big money, anonymous contributors, corporations pretending to be people, pursuing business plans in the guise of politics and encouraging many politicians to say things and do things that would not have been seen in the best interests of the public in years past. I grew up uh, in a political family and my father was in the Congress for 10 years before I was born and uh, did not leave the Senate, defeated in 1970 because of his opposition to the Vietnam War and support of the Voting Rights Act and so forth, until I was out of college. So I saw it all my life and some seven, eight years after that, uh, I went to the House of Representatives. But the varied experiences that I've had in my lifetime have given me um, an idiosyncratic uh, view of the, the arc of American democracy over the last uh, six decades. And it's changed quite a bit. Most of our elected officials now are forced by this system to spend five hours a day on the telephone raising money or going to cocktail parties and events to raise money from special interests. And it's a kabuki routine that both sides, uh, the, the askers and the givers, understand. It spiraled downward the crassness with which the quids pro quo at the heart of the equation are made uh, openly uh, visible, uh, that crassness has grown as well. And over time, those who are drawn to participate in such a culture have changed. Many men and women who I wish were in politics aren't in politics now. Why would they be? And some that I surely wish were not in politics or <laughs> speaking for long stretches of time. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the point is not to make it an ad hominem discourse, but to focus on the changes in the system that have led to these problems. And the influence of money is number one on the list. David, you were uh, generous and kind in your comments about the Founding Fathers. Back in those days, uh, at the birth of our country, uh, Thomas Paine was able to walk out of his front door in Philadelphia and find a dozen low-cost print shops within 10 square blocks. And he printed uh, common sense. He had no money, came from England as a penniless immigrant, but he had the gift of clear thinking and clear expression. And he published Common Sense, and it became the Harry Potter of the late 18th century, <laughs> and helped to inspire the American Revolution. And in those days, when the marketplace of ideas was dominated by a technology that was easily accessible by individuals, individuals could use ideas as a way to counterbalance power and money. As the decades rolled by and we entered the 20th century, by mid-century, by the 60s, uh, 1960s anyway, television eclipsed the printing press. And today is completely dominant, although the internet will soon be powerful enough to bring another dominant medium. But today, Thomas Paine, could walk out his front door in Philadelphia with his newly created uh, video called Common Sense and walk down to the nearest TV station or, and say, this is really important. I, I need to get it before the public's mind. Um, when do I go on the air? 
Well, you know the answer. Unless he has uh, several million dollars to pay the gatekeeper, he doesn't have access to the public's mind over the medium that now dominates our democracy. Who does have access? The same special interests that hold the fundraisers here in Washington and elsewhere. And their messages prevail. And the politicians who have to beg them for enough money to put their 30-second TV ads on end up paying the piper, ever more so. And it has gotten to the point now where vibrant, intelligent discourse, including spirited disagreements, that's how we come to the right decisions. It doesn't take place anymore. Facts uh, don't appear to matter. Preconceived ideas are simply repeated over and over and over with greater force and more loudness as if that makes them true. And now, once again, uh, power and, and wealth is pushing ideas and political discourse back out of the system. Now, the Internet is beginning to change this. Bl individual bloggers can change the discourse now. <laughs> Television is still dominant because the average American watches it five hours a day, and the number of minutes goes up every year, even in the age of the Internet. But we're at a tipping point. And that's why this initiative here at Brookings comes at an ideal time. Now, the potential for a shutdown that uh, is going to unfold before us uh, this weekend really reminds me, how could it not, of the shutdown that we went through when uh, Elaine K. Mark uh, was working with me on reinventing government. And she uh, told a story this morning, let, leaving out some important details, uh, <laughs> uh, on uh, what's your blog, uh, FixGov, FixGov. During the last shutdown, it had uh, occurred not that long after the uh, Oklahoma City bombing and the destruction of the Murrah Building, a fantastic, horrible tragedy. And uh, President Clinton was about to make his State of the Union address, and uh, I went to Elaine K. Mark and I said, I want you to talk with our reinventing government team, and I want you to find me somebody. This was after the government had shut, had shut down, that's right. I said, I want you to find me a man or a woman that qualifies according to three criteria. Number one, this person must have been inside the Murrah building when the bomb went off. Number two, this person must have been a hero in the aftermath of that tragedy, many were. Number three, this person must have been relocated to another temporary government building, which was itself shut down by the, uh, the congressionally mandated shutdown. So she went to work on it and got help from one of our team, Susan Valskovich. And they came up with this incredible guy named Richard Dean, who was a Vietnam veteran, and he was in the Murray Building. And God bless him, he went back into that burning building and saved three people by himself and brought a, the body of a, uh, of a deceased co-worker out. Uh, and then he went to a temporary building, and when the Congress forced the shutdown, he was told to go home. And so I told uh, President Clinton, this would be great for your State of the Union. And we could put Richard Dean right next to the First Lady. Well, now his speechwriters, who were great speechwriters, by the way, uh, this was a temporary lapse of judgment, uh, <laughs> said, no, that's, ter that's a terrible idea. Uh, we have three uh, runners who carried the Olympic torch, uh, and we're going to have the Olympics, and this will be very inspiring, and we want them next to the First Lady to tell that story. I said, please. Please, 
you don't understand. This, this, this needs to be done. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, after they all left, uh, President Clinton and I had a pretty good way of talking to one another, and he said, okay, Al. So the day of the speech comes, and I'm sitting up on uh, the dais there. Uh, somebody could write a book just about the things that happen up on that dais there. <laughs> Like the time uh, earlier when President Clinton went, and I was standing up, sitting up there as VP and everybody's standing, you know, I don't know how many standing ovations come off, but, but uh, he goes to look at the teleprompter and he's smiling, he turns around and looks at me and says, Al, they have the wrong speech on the teleprompter. <laughs> and uh, I ducked off the podium, went down George Stephanopoulos, down George, we've got the wrong speech on. So uh, President Clinton, uh, and of course, from my vantage point, I could see when they were frantically scrolling, trying to find the right <laughs> file in the teleprompter, uh, and completely unflappably, President Clinton extemporized for eight minutes. It was the best eight minutes of the speech. <laughs> and then finally, uh, the, the text stabilized, and he seamlessly got into the rest of the speech. But anyway, that's another book. This time... He goes through the presentation of Richard Dean and a genuinely inspiring story, as I've noted. And I'm sitting there, and to my left is the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. And he said uh, all the heroic things Richard Dean has, had done and triggered a standing ovation, and we're standing there cl clapping, and I look over at Newt, and I said, Newt, wait for it. <laughs> And we sat back down, and, and the president said, uh, basically, unfortunately, that was not the only time that Richard Dean was forced out of his office. And he went in <laughs> and <laughs> said, and on behalf of Richard Dean and all of these other heroic bodies, let us pledge that we will never shut down this government again. I leaped to my feet, <laughs> and, and I looked over and said, I told you to wait for it. <laughs> anyway. Nothing uh, particularly funny about what's going on now, but here's what those who are threatening the shutdown and the default should understand. In situations like this, the president of our country has, as he or she should have, an inherent advantage in speaking for the whole country. And when the Congress can't even when the minority can't even get its act together to pass its own substitute version of what ought to happen, that just further illustrates the fact that the president, speaking for the country, leading the country, uh, is going to win this confrontation. But it's not a game. It's not something that uh, is just a political contest. But they ought to understand that. And don't put our economy through this. In any case, I am uh, excited about the future uh, of these efforts to make government work so well that when the average citizen hears some threat to the continued operation of the government, they will think about the high quality service they've just been delivered. They will think about the individuals who are working hard to redeem the promise of American uh, self-government. And they will say, no, we, we're, this is our government, and, and we need to, 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 to make it work well. And with the challenges that are coming up now, we have got to take the lessons that Elaine K. Mark and her team will be exploring and presenting here and make sure uh, that they are spread far and wide. Uh, I'll close where I began. I truly believe that the launching of this center is far more than an ordinary or routine new center announced by a preeminent uh, institution like Brookings. This one uh, is going to make an even larger difference than normal. This one really is at the heart of what we need to do to make the United States of America what our founders intended and what our people deserve. So we found out when we were doing this work of reinventing government that 
It doesn't always get headlines. In fact, it seldom got headlines, except when I went on David Letterman to break an ashtray <laughs> and things like that. But it doesn't capture attention in the way it should because it, 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 it's hard work. And it requires rolling up your sleeves and, and, and really uh, getting things done. But it is absolutely central. And I could not be happier that Brookings, with all of its uh, greatness and tradition, has recognized the individual who can do this better than any other and has, a pro and has allocated the resources and the, the, the organizational uh, uh, work to, to launch this center. I congratulate Brookings, I congratulate you, Elaine, and I congratulate your colleagues, and I predict great things. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, that's right. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, David. Sorry if I went over a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for that tour de force. Um, we've got a great deal of questions from the audience, so but time for a couple. So why don't I just start okay. right in? Okay. And we've got a great question from... Tony Smith of the French American Foundation, who asks a pretty big question. In light of our persistent inability to get anything done in Washington, is it time to think of abandoning the separation of powers in order to produce more responsive government? <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was a big one. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> but but let's, uh, uh, l let me add, add just a bit to that. <laughs> I'm surprised by the question. I'm not surprised by the level of frustration that leads to the question. But uh, the essential genius of our founders is as relevant today as it was when they wrote the Constitution, arguably even more so. There is in human nature a power-seeking impulse. And uh, many thinkers over the centuries have expressed in different ways, the thought that, in Lord Acton's words, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, but the essential genius of, of our founders was an understanding that this is a, a key aspect of human nature and is not tethered to any particular ide ideology or a set of political viewpoints. Anyone who is put in a position of exercising too much power is vulnerable to wanting more power. Uh, and the only way to contain that uh, uh, threat to, to freedom is to create an equipoise by balancing different centers of power against one another to create a space in between where individuals can be relatively invulnerable to the abuse of power by any one center because it will trigger a countervailing force from one of the other centers. Uh, and and um, so much more to say, but, but uh, that, 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 that's an insight that we, we've got to protect. Another one from Stephanie Lesage. Um, according to you, what can make all Americans acknowledge the global climate change and address this issue? And the, the contrast about Europeans seem to be much more aware of this issue. What, what's the difference? Uh, well, uh, part of it is what I was uh, describing earlier uh, in the description of television and big money in our politics. Uh, there's been an extremely well-funded uh, campaign uh, of uh, distortion. Uh, and it was modeled very consciously on the campaign uh, undertaken by the tobacco companies uh, some decades ago. In fact, uh, a terrific uh, book co-authored by Naomi Oreskes, uh, 
uh, called Merchants of Doubt documents this in a great detail. They've hired some of the same people that uh, put out lies in return for money uh, for the tobacco companies to do the same thing for large carbon polluters. Uh, and you, you remember the tobacco companies hired actors and dressed them up as doctors and put them in front of cameras <laughs> with a, a script that uh, had them saying they were doctors and public didn't need to worry about lung cancer or any other diseases that uh, they might have heard were linked to cigarettes because as doctors they could reassure them there was no such uh, uh, thing to worry about. And uh, many tens of millions of people died uh, during the 40 years between the Surgeon General's warning and the first meaningful steps to, to rein in the deceptive uh, marketing and, and the killing of people. So they're, they're doing exactly the same thing now. Uh, and, you know, 97% of all the climate scientists uh, agree with the consensus. Uh, and, and if, God forbid, you had chest pains that got worse, and if you were able to consult the 100 leading heart doctors in the world, and 97 of them said, uh, oh, my God, you need to have this procedure and change your diet and exercise. And there were three that said, well, I'm not sure yet. Uh, <laughs> I need to do some more tests. Uh, what, what would you do? Uh, I mean, it, the answer is pretty simple, but that's what the world, that's the question the world faces now. Uh, and here in the U.S., the news media has been intimidated, uh, frightened. Uh, and not only frightened, uh, they are vulnerable to distorted news judgments because the line separating news and entertainment has long since been uh, crossed. And ratings uh, have a big influence on the selection of stories that are put on the news. And the, the deniers of the climate crisis, quite a few of them uh, paid by the uh, large fossil fuel uh, polluters. Um, really, it's like a family with an alcoholic father who flies into a rage if anyone mentions alcohol. And so the rest of the family decides to keep the peace by never mentioning the elephant in the room. <laughs> and many in the news media are exactly in that position. They get swarmed by these deniers online and in letters and pickets and all that if they even mention the word climate. And so they very timidly, uh, they get frightened and they're afraid to mention the word climate. Now some of them are changing now, thank goodness. But this is, and, and while the news media is not mentioning it here, has not been, the, 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 the large uh, corporate-driven advertising agenda uh, has kept putting out these messages. Why, why, are, uh, why is so-called clean coal one of the three principal sponsors <laughs> of every news program and every uh, public, uh, every uh, talking head show? Why is that? Is, is it because they have an idea that the consumers watching television are, go are going to say, uh, Mildred, I'm going to go down to the store and buy us some coal. <laughs> no, no. Their purpose is to condition thinking uh, and to prevent the consideration of a price on carbon. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. And, and so, you know, as uh, both President Clinton and I have said, uh, it's an old saying that if uh, you see a turtle on top of a fence post, it's a pretty good idea, didn't, pretty good bet that it didn't get there by itself. When you see this anomalous uh, outcome here in the U.S. public, it didn't happen by itself. One last question, and it's uh, from Wilson Golden, of uh, Vice President of Government Affairs at Xerox. What's next for you? And how might those of us nearing retirement become active in your good works? Oh, what a lovely question. <laughs> I, th <laughs> I thought I'd end with the softball here. Uh, <laughs> Well, a as a chairman of the Climate Reality Project, I spend most of my time uh, on trying to uh, 
move uh, our country and the world past the political tipping point beyond which we recognize the reality of what's going on. Um, you know, in the, in the late 19th century, there was a cholera epidemic in London. And a famous doctor there made a map and put a dot every place there was a case of cholera. And he overlaid the map on the sewer system of London. And in that way, found that one malfunctioning pump on Broad Street was the proximate cause. And, and just a few years later, Louis Pasteur uh, found the biological cause. And they connected the dots, and cholera is no longer the mass killer it once was. We need to connect the dots now uh, because the 90 million tons of global warming pollution that we spew every day into the atmosphere, as I said earlier, as if it's an open sewer, uh, are trapping the heat, causing all of these extreme, uh, cause, making worse and contributing to the extreme weather event that is uh, events that are related to climate. And these extreme temperature events are now 100 times more common than they were just 30 years ago. When will we awaken to the point where we say, hey, we've got to do something about that? That's how I spend most of my time. And the Climate Reality Project uh, will have its third annual 24 hours of reality next month, a global telecast. We had 18 million viewers last year. We're launching a number of new websites. I also work, uh, as David uh, said earlier in the private equity. I'm co-founder and chairman of Generation Investment Management, which pursues sustainable capitalism. And although I didn't have uh, the occasion to talk about that in depth here, I know that your corporate purpose uh, initiative is, uh, is really in the same space, and we'd love to work with you on that. So anybody that uh, wants to uh, help on the climate issue, go to Climate Reality. Uh, dot org and and uh, we, we'd love to have your help and and Elaine thank you again for inviting me here today well thank you very much and if everyone would please be seated while the vice president leaves um, on behalf of Brookings and and certainly on behalf of myself thanks so much for coming by my pleasure thank you all very much